Good afternoon. I'm the Reverend Charisma Jean Marie, and I serve as the Director for Racial Justice Ministries at Scarrett Bennett Center in Nashville, Tennessee. We're grateful that you will join us for another live conversation this afternoon. Um, this afternoon, I'm really excited. Um, our conversation is entitled Raising Coal Conspirators, the Library Edition. Library Edition. This afternoon, we have library professionals who will come and share about the work they do here um, there at uh, Nashville Public Library um, and also the resources that are available to you, adults who are um, in conversation with the young people in your life about racism and diversity and difference. Um, we've been having these conversations these last two weeks, and this uh, third week really is pushing for resources um, and also uh, providing you models and, and tools and ways to have these conversations. As we've been saying these last two weeks, research shows at the tender age of six months, your child already see the difference in skin color. And before they even learn how to speak, you have already taught them your ethics, your um, ways in seeing the world. You're teaching your children verbally or non-verbally, intentionally and unintentionally. Your children are learning from you. They're watching you. They're hearing you in terms of how to treat people who look differently from them. Um, and so we want you, we want to invite you to be a co-conspirator, to raise co-conspirators, to be intentional about having conversations with the young people in your life about racism because listen, racism is the water that we drink. It's the air that we breathe. It is part of the American culture. It's how we are all socialized. It exists. We see it every day. We live it, breathe it every single day. And so does your children. And I think children are our only hope for the future. And we can participate in that future, the hope in the future, by being intentional about providing, or providing resources and having intentional conversations with young people about what it means to be a co-conspirator. Uh, Scarrett Bennett Center, co-conspiratorship is not a title, but it's a way of life. It's about being bold and intentional about dismantling white supremacy in white spaces for white people every single day. It's not just about going to the rally or the march, but it's about the conversations, the complex, difficult um, conversations you have around the table with your family members. And for Black people, it's the talks that we have about what it means to be Black in America, what it means to be Brown in America, and how do we, uh, Black and Brown communities, the people in our communities, how do we heal from racial trauma? Um, racism uh, dehumanizes everyone. <laughs> uh, we're all dehumanized in this system. And so we're called, I believe we are called in the necessary work we need to do to dismantle white supremacy among us. And we at Scarrett Bennett Center, we believe to do that is to be co-conspirators. And so I'm grateful for our guests this afternoon as they come and, and talk about the work they do there in the library. And for those who are not in Nashville, uh, we just want to remind you while the, the conversation is local, but it really is going to give you some ideas of how to ask questions and what you should be looking for um, and to um, for your library and the professionals there in your city. So again, thank you for joining us. And as always, you're always welcome uh, to participate in the comments, um, the conversation by commenting your thoughts and even your questions. We welcome your questions and we will have Q&A later on in the conversation. Um, this is sacred space and our way is radical hospitality and we believe in, in caring for our guests under our care. And so while differences of opinions are always welcome, you don't have to agree with us and you can share your, dis your difference of opinion, your, your thoughts with us. Us, but difference does not mean hate or disrespect. And so any comments that reflect hate or disrespect, we will delete immediately. Um, so again, thank you for joining us this afternoon. And I want to uh, make way for our three guests uh, who will come and share um, the work that who they are and the work that they do there in the library. So let's start with you, Andrea Blackman. Why don't you introduce yourself and share um, the work that you do there in, in, in the Nashville Public Library? 
Hi. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, and thank you for having us, Shreds and I. We really are sincerely um, grateful to be part of this conversation. We thank you for the sacredness of the space. Um, and I don't speak on behalf of the library, but I will say thank you for inviting the three of us um, to join this space today. I'm Andrea Blackman, and I serve as the Division Director of Special Collections um, Center, um, which includes both the Civil Rights Center and also the Votes for Women Center. Uh, my job primarily is, um, besides administrative work, is to make sure that our public library system is thoughtfully and proactively and intentionally um, creating public programs at, that engage all of our communities at all locations. Um, I serve as um, program coordinator um, with my colleague for our department. And so that's what I do, making sure that we are intentional about having these collaborative conversations with our community and providing the resources that our educators need, that our parents need, and they're just the community at large. Thank you and welcome, for, welcome, welcome, Andrea. If you have not been to the Nashville Public Library there downtown, um, the, the Civil Rights Room, let me encourage you. It's really a Saturday. I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic. You can't do that now. But when we do open back up, the world will open back up one day once we get um, a, a, a vaccine. Um, but I want to encourage you when, when you when you can, if you have not already, to go to that room. It is such beautiful history, such a beautiful experience. But thank you so much, Andrea, for being here. And Tasmin Grace, won't you introduce yourself and talk about the work that you do there in the library? Yes, good afternoon. I'm Tasmin and Saria Grace. I work down at the downtown library, the main library. And it is my joy to help design engagements in the Civil Rights Center and the Votes for Women Center, which we collectively call sort of the Human Rights Center at the library. So what I do is try to think about ways to help our guests connect the history that is told in both those spaces to their contemporary experiences. So how do people, regardless of where you're from, and in this case, all over the world visiting Nashville, how do they make sense of say the 1950s and 1960s? And how is it so relevant? How is sort of history pulsing through the times in which we're still living in. And that's what I do from students to seniors. We have family reunion groups. We talk to corporations, boards, all sorts of people who are interested in being engaged in history and trying to see how it matters to them today. So glad to have you. Thank you for being here. Claire Marie, Claire Marie won't you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the work that you do there in the library? Of course. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Sharizna, um, for inviting me and inviting all of us to um, share with uh, the Scared Bennett audience about um, all the, the work that the library does. Um, I am the Family Literacy Coordinator for Bringing Books to Life. Bringing Books to Life is the library's award-winning literacy outreach program. Um, in typical times, we travel throughout Davidson County every um to schools and daycares um child care centers community organizations public or private and what we do is that we share the love of books with children teachers and parents we develop curricula based around the library's puppet shows um, we have a 70 plus year um tradition of puppet of pu puppeteering professional um professional theater shows once you know of uh, speaking into it speaking it into existence once the library opens opens back up and you take a day, you go to the civil rights room. And also um, if you have young children or children of all ages really take in a puppet show. Uh, we have beautiful um, workspace on lit on liter on, on classic literature. Those puppet shows get put on a truck nowadays on Zoom and children all around the country, all around Davidson County get to see those. We do story times based on those puppet shows. We do teacher trainings. And what I specifically do as, as the family literacy coordinator is that I um, partner with um, local um, schools, community organizations to um, present family literacy workshops to parents, uh, to parents of young children, early literacy and school age, to, to show them how they can um, share books more often in their daily lives, but also how they already have 
powerful assets uh, within their daily practices to really um, have a positive effect on their, on, the, on their children learning to read and their children's literacy development. So we, uh, we share things that parents can do at home. We read books aloud. We show different read aloud techniques, things that parents are already doing, but really sort of show them like, this is highly educative make it intentional. I also I also love to share books um, with parents and children. Um, I also write for the National Public Library children's blog. And another thing that um, I've been um, that I've actually been doing is that myself and another colleague have been presenting on webinars for state library systems throughout the country. We've been doing this virtually since the pandemic hit um, that we've been um, um, presenting um, about a, a webinar on tackling racism in classic children's literature. So the library went through a process where we looked at some of the books in our collection and said, you know, some of these children's books classics are racist and they're still on our shelves. And how do we balance our our, our calls for um, diversity and inclusion with the library value of you know freedom of information, freedom of expression, and um, anti censorship. So that's so that's on the, the sort of the things that I am I'm involved in at Nashville Public Library. Awesome, Claire Marie. So glad to have you bringing books to life. So as we get started in this conversation, I, I want to start with um, Andrea and Tasmin, particularly around the work that you all do when uh, teachers, educators call you and invite you into the classroom to have conversations around dismantling white supremacy, racism, diversity. Would you share a little ex of your experience about what it means to decolonize curriculum in the classroom, not just in the classroom, again, our conversation is with all adults, right, who have children in their midst. And so it is curriculum everywhere, the, even the curriculum we have at home. How do we decolonize the curriculum so that it is inclusive and it tells the true history, right, the real history um, and, 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 and ways to dismantle white supremacy? Tazim, would you like to start as the Tazim leads our program right. coordination for our department? Um, and so she is usually the first line of the first person that educators and parents will connect with when they are wanting to have these conversations. So it's natural that we will start with Tazim. Mm -hmm. Hey, Andrea. Hey, um, one, of the <laughs> one of the things that happens is we enter into a conversation about vocabulary. So right now in this conversation, we're using some big concepts that are bigger than many of the people who are requesting time with us use. They don't often say white supremacy. They don't often view their lesson plans as being um, colonized. They often come into the conversation with us asking for history. They want to know about something that happened way back when. They want to know about the old days. Depending on who the group is, they want um, our assistance in helping them to see that those moments are over, that we've arrived at a new place, this is a new day, and we can talk about what used to be. What happens in our conversation then um, is we start talking about where we come into a space that suggests that their history is a tether between then and now, it's not a stopgap. So the first conversations are, what are you seeking to experience? How can we get you there? And then how can we take you beyond that? That's where it gets exciting. I think Andrea would agree um, because a lot of times the responses we get is that, oh, I'm leaving feeling differently than I expected to. And I'm leaving with different perspectives than I came in with. So to even get people to start to question the curriculum that they're already using and even bigger than that, get them to realize that we're not providing a history lesson in the sense that we close the door on a reality. Instead, we're sort of broadening the door. We're opening a window to say, this is still in the room. That, um, not everyone goes for it. <laughs> Andre and I have had people actually say, okay, that's a little beyond what we're ready for. 
And, and we take that to a lot of what we do is tailor made for the audiences that we serve. We get very excited when people are expecting that they can be introspective, that they can ask more questions, that they can look for more than just dates and some bi biographies of folks. But once we sort of cross that bridge into understanding that we're talking about history as a continuum, then the conversation gets really juicy because now we're talking about conversation. We're wanting the guests to be more critical analysts. We don't want them to be passive listeners. And so we're very upfront about that. This is an interactive experience. This is an experience in which you will be expected to identify what you see in an old black and white photo from 1952. And then how do you compare it to the life you're living in 2020? Who are you in those photos and who are you in history? And so it really does, it does call for a different kind of experience. And I think the ones that some people think they're going to get where they kind of go, all oh, right, Dr. King. Hmm. And so we're, we're hoping that we, we nudge folks beyond this sort of comfortable space of, of the feel good. It's not always feel good. And um, we also talk about, you mentioned here, sacred space. We talk about that. We try to make people feel like they can be both introspective and curious and transparent. That's, uh, that's where we hope to end up. It is not where we begin. But our intention to help people recognize that we are living within the history that we are speaking about, mm -hmm. that's our goal. That's our goal. Andrea, what would you add to that? Um, I would add that, you know, uh, so much of our work, thank you, Tazim, so much of our work is in, you know, I, I would say all of it is intentional. Um, both Tazneem and I have backgrounds and experience in education and being in the classroom. So we've been on both sides of that desk in the classroom. Um, and so we both have experience in creating curriculum and helping educators understand how what we do simply fuses with what they are trying to convey, whether it's a social studies standards or is it a public speaking you know, criteria that you're trying to do. So you have both this idea um, when we're working with educators and parents, not only to be introspective, not only to look behind history, but also to help take some of the stress that those teachers, you know, spend those 7.25 hours in the classroom. We get it. We, that's the first thing we say is, yeah, we've been there kindergarten through high school. We've taught them all. Um, and we understand how difficult this topic can be for several educators. And so we also approach to this with the standpoint of educators who are uncomfortable talking about race, if you're uncomfortable saying supremacy, as Tazani mentioned the language, maybe you allow us to do that. Maybe you allow us to come in your classroom and help lead this conversation and let us become your visiting scholars for this lesson or for this experience. Um, and so one of the things we help educators realize is that we can fuse our work into their curriculum to take some of that administrative stress off of, you know, following these standards that the state of Tennessee or any state requires them to do. Um, we also make it as simple for educators as tell us what you hope these young people are walk, wanting to walk away with. You know, for some schools, it's the idea of we want them to learn kindness. We want them to understand what happened here in Nashville in 1960, or we want them to be able to go home and continue these conversations. And so we are intentional with how we are working with our parents and our educators, um, but we do that with a lot of prep. You know, we do that with spending a lot of time with educators going, I mean, hours of working with them, aligning their requirements, their curriculum with our goals of this introspective work. And we are constantly, Tasmania mentioned the language shift, we're constantly making sure that they are comfortable with certain language. We tailor every experience with every educator. And you know, and on some days, we can have over 1200 young people that we have worked with in an entire month. You know, I mean, one day we had 260 kids in, in, a, in a day that we spent hours and hours with, but the experience is so tailored um, based on the curriculum design and based on the experiences that we hope these young people begin, as you said, you know, become these new co-conspirators, but they are beyond just a one-time experience of understanding, you know, yes, this person was shot and killed, and how does that relate to me? Yeah, this is, oh my God, as the both of you were talking, what I was thinking about was bell hooks and her um, push for critical thinkers, right? What it means to um, encourage and develop critical thinkers, right? Children who have the ability to act, not just receive information, but to really examine, right? 
information and to ask questions. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about history. Because, I mean, you mentioned this before. Oftentimes in curriculums in the classroom, history that's told, that's taught in this country is usually whitewashed. Um, it's often the kind of history you tell that makes um, this idea of politics of respectability, right? Um, this niceness. We want to tell this horrible story about us, but we want to kind of clean it up and make it nice. So we, we, we leave out, right, some of the truths, right? Um, it happens a lot. Um, even um, Texas, I remember, is one of the states where um, they wanted to change the language of slavery to servants, right? Um, so I want to talk, uh, so would you say a little bit more about um, why it's important to tell the whole truth, right, about our history and how um, using library resources to do that? My pleasure. When we have students, whatever grade they're coming to us in, and again, Andrea, we've been gone into teaching with graduate students. The central question we want them to ask is says who? So if someone tells you who your hero is supposed to be or who your shero is supposed to be, we would love for them to say, well, says who? Which is very different than the many of us were, were taught. We were indoctrinated into, okay, let's get our bibliography going. And this person said it, so it's true. We want them to be extensively curious. We want them to go beyond the first thought. We want them to question us, which again is counter to how many of us were raised. We're not standing before them as authorities, as keepers of the temple of knowledge. We're hoping that we are encouraging them to be researchers and thinkers. The library, of course, is full of different materials that can help debunk a myth or create another myth. So we are also wanting them to examine the room if they, if they do get the opportunity to come into the Civil Rights Center and the Votes Women's Center. We want them to come in with questions and a little bit of suspicion as well. So who designed this space? We ask them, what do you think this space is supposed to make you feel? Not one way. And so depending on how they walk in and what history they walk in with and the stories from their families they walk in with, one person can say the Civil Rights Center feels inspiring, a complete another person can say it feels depressing. One person can say it feels like it's telling the truth. Another person comes in and says, this is all a bunch of crap. And that's very real. But the fact that we invite them to be investigative and suspicious, I think is where the beginning seeds of critical analysis get planted. We are not giving you one truth. We don't believe there is one truth. We believe in the truths of kindness and the ethics that we talk about of goodness and respecting each other. But the truth in terms of how history is remembered, we want them to question who's telling it. And so then, of course, to use the library to gather voices. Well, this author said this. Why did this other author say something different? Why does this one picture communicate pain and to a whole other set of eyes, it communicates protection? Our, the sweet spot we get into is when you have one group of people and they all start sharing the different perspectives they're gaining from the experience. And then we know we've hit upon something really special because we want them to recognize everyone's not going to remember or retell history in the same way. Just as you said, Trisna, we don't have to agree. Agreement doesn't mean love. Agreement just means this is the thought I keep thinking and the thing I keep telling myself I should believe. So when we invite and give our guests permission to question us, to question this thing we, we call history, to question even photography, which you think is sort of locking a scene in time, but even that, you can look at it and see things total different ways. And that's what we're hoping we inspire. Is, is there another way to see this? Is there another way to understand this? Andrea loves to talk about Dr. King and how the reverence with which we speak his name doesn't allow for us to look at him as a renegade, doesn't allow for us to look at him as a conspirator, let alone co-conspirator. And so really pushing the envelope on who we have declared as our sort of mentors in revolution. We're supposed to think great, big, delicious and reverential thoughts about Rosa Parks and we forget all the other people who might have stood up to authorities on buses and on street corners and all that. We forget about all those folks. We want them to come in and say, how come there's no women in this room? We want them to go into the votes for women space and say, how come the women all look like they're elders? Where are the young people? We want, you know, so we're wanting them to question and we're not shying away from that. We see that as that's, that's when we feel like we've done something real. 
is when they start to ask us questions, which means we look at ourselves differently. What you say, Andrea? I, I would add to that what distinguishes us in our work and our the spaces that we are talking about from any other space um, is the fact that we have an entire collection built on history, but not just one perspective. And so when Tazneem is talking about those, you know, as any educators that are listening know those primary source materials, you know, we don't always just start with the John Lewis and the Diane Nash oral history. Ah, let's not even go there. Let's dig deep into an oral history of someone who says, wait a minute, I didn't even believe in the nonviolent movement. I was just there because I needed to get out. Like, is he a revolutionary or and why was his story left out of the room? So we have an entire collection, whether that's oral histories, photographs, primary sources, you know, handbooks that some of these giants carried around with them in the 1960s to help us tell that story and challenge history. Love it, love it, love it, love it. I, I want to talk a little about oh, language. I want to talk a little bit about language. Um, when, when I hear you, both of you talk, you are the passion, the love for this work exudes. It, it makes you, like for me, it makes me want to come in the classroom and learn from you. Um, that's impossible to do when you're uncomfortable. And oftentimes, Adults get really uncomfortable with language like white supremacy and racism and race and how it translates to children, right? And how children now becomes uncomfortable. Um, I know growing up, um, one of the things that would all we would often say is you should never talk in public about politics, religion, or money, right? Politics, mm. religion, or money. And then it's also, you should never talk about race in public. And these ideas that these mm -hmm. conversations should not be taught in public is killing us as a society. So we keep these secret thoughts and they translate in, in actions that are hateful and even violent, right? And there is no reckoning um, like emotional justice would say, or in this work, racial justice, the call out to call people back in. Right. And so I want to talk a little bit with you all, if you can share a little bit why I want to flip it from educators to now uh, 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 parents and uh, coaches and adults who have children. Why is it important to normalize these languages um, in children, languages like race and racism and diversity and difference and white supremacy? Why should parents normalize those types of words in the home so that it makes it easier for educators to educate in the classroom? Hmm. Do you well, want to start with name or you want to start or Clem Marie, whoever? I was going to say either one of us could start. Clem, you yes. wanted to start? Yeah, I, I'll go ahead and start. Um, it's funny because Sharesna, you just said about normalizing language in the home. Part of the reason why um, the family literacy workshops that Bringing Books Alive does are called Loving and Learning Family Literacy Workshops is that when we were sort of speaking, um, t t talking, you know, working with schools, we were reaching teachers and we were reaching with, with teacher trainings and we were reaching um children with story times, but that critical piece of literacy development um, also needs to happen at home because after those seven and a half hours the children, um, you know, after those seven and a half hours the children are in the classroom are done, they go home. They go home to their parents, they go home to their family members and sort of to complete the literacy loop that can, you know, the reading and the sto sharing stories needs to continue. And I think also in this, in the situation of having conversations around race because a lot of times when we don't talk about it it becomes a bad thing you know sort of that black person or you know that you know race and you know sort of the whisper and the um the shame because we've been taught yes that we don't talk about these things these are not conversations for polite society and the thing is also um part of it's it's that we have to get used to to having having these conversations and to um talk with children as opposed to like, you know, children will say just about anything, but a lot of times like, oh, look at that, you know, look at that person over there. And they'll say that black person over there, or, you know, like, oh, no, 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 don't say that. It's like, yes, they are. Yes, they are black. That's because they have more melanin in their skin than you do. So it's talking about with children, very simple terms. Uh, there's, you know, as a librarian, as someone who works with children and parents, 
I can definitely give you a list of books. I did prepare for this conversation, a list called Books for Discussing Diversity and Difference with Young Children. It's a book list that I've made that's uh, publicly viewable on the library website and just some ways to start sort of ways to have the conversation. It's sort of, we're talking about the realities of race. It's it's a different, it's just a difference in melanin. And you start to develop, you know, having the conversation around that and knowing that these aren't one-time conversations. Um, no child wants to be sat down to have a very serious conversation about something. That's like the talk that parents have about the birds and the bees. It's like, oh my gosh, that's so embarrassing. And you know, you shared a story decades on, it was so embarrassing. And and it was so uncomfortable. And we need to, to be able to talk about sex and race, these kinds of things. And, you know, and these are conversations we come back to with children again and again. With young children, maybe you're just, you know, that's because, you know, oh yes, they're black because they have more melanin in their skin. One little piece. And you continue to come back to it. And with the books that you read, sharing stories with the children in your home and the children in your home, the children in your life, stories that have diverse, you know, you know, that are diverse books as people in the children's literature um, world call it, that have that children of all backgrounds being children and sort of making it part of the convert, making part, making it part of the conversation. And I think for me, uh, particularly even for adults, picture books are a good way. Books are a great way to start a conversation, um, start a conversation with children to talk about your feelings. And even for adults, picture books are a great way to sort of start having it because it can it can help you to enter into a conversation in a particular way. And sometimes I'm a big proponent of picture books because it can really, they can really reveal deep truths that you know, you're reading a bit thick, long book and it's like, yes, you are working through this, but sometimes, you know, a really good picture book will distill it and sort of to a way to start the conversation and come back to it again and again. I think it's interesting, Clem said, we should be talking about sex and, and race all together. Yeah, let's see how that works for us in the Great South, Clem. Let's like, make educator. We're going to talk about sex and we're going to talk about race. That, that's going to be great. It's um, going to be great, but I think it's also, it's part of the sort of removing the shame around yeah. these topics. Yeah. And uh, I think particularly sometimes for white folks, there is the very real fear of getting it wrong. Well, you're going to get it wrong. That's just a part of it. And it's, but it's also having, I guess, the, that recognition, the humility of, oh, let me learn, let me learn again. Yeah, I come at it at a different angle than Clem. I, I enter into this space of having conversations with adults, not through the use of a picture book. You know, I, I come at it through the use of having them look at themselves. Right, because what we're finding when we get when we we're wanting to we meaning the collective we have communities, you know, we say that we don't we are we're not racist, right? And very seldom will you hear the common lay person say that they're anti-racist or they're working toward. We hear the word ally a lot. We hear the word I'm genuine, um, I'm kind. I just want the best for people. So I enter into these conversations with the community. Um, with a different lens of putting the the responsibility on them because if they are going to be what they are claiming they want to be, whether it is being an anti-racist and what that journey looks like individually for them or collectively for their, you know, for their home or their organization, then that responsibility lies on them. And so I start with them examining themselves in that conversation. So we're going to look at who we are and how we see race and, and how we go and ask ourselves, why are we uncomfortable? What is it about the word supremacy that makes you uncomfortable? Let's start there, right? And so the idea of one of the things that Tazanim and I try to do is, you know, again, you talked about that sacred space, letting everyone know everyone's struggling. We're all dealing with something. We all are swimming upstream. We all come into this space with hundreds of years in our backpack. I'm unpacking as they are unpacking. And that reality, you know, we use a lot of levity. We we are very comfortable helping people understand that we do, we can get beyond the discomfort. In order for us to get beyond the discomfort, um, there are certain steps we have to take. Now, I will say, um, and, and Tazanine could get echo on this, when we are doing our facilitation with adults, we come, um, even that work, we come to it with different approaches. You know, I, I, I tend to lean a little bit more in line with the work of Dr. Ibram Kendi as Taz named. Some people aren't just ready for those conversations. Some people will never be ready, but those people who are ready and who are committed and are joining us in this um, journey, those are the people and that's where I'm gonna spend my energy and work toward. 
Thank you for that. I want to remind the viewers, if you have any questions or comments, to please add them to the comment section of this live stream. And also the resources that you're hearing our guest list are also posted on our comment sections for your usage as well. Um, thank you. This is this is so great. And, and, and people are already commenting, really appreciating this conversation. Um, Andre, you, you mentioned something. I want to talk about implicit bias and that the reality is there are many, particularly white people, white educators, white parents who um, often enter the conversation unaware of their implicit bias. And you cannot enter the conversation of educating children, young people about racism if you don't believe racism exists. And if you don't believe that you are drinking and, and, and breathing the air of racism, that the American culture, our society, right, is racist. You cannot approach this conversation. And I often think, particularly white people, approach this conversation with uh, very careful because they're afraid of messing up. They're afraid of saying or doing something that will make them look bad or shameful, right? And so I'd invite all of you, would you, and, and, and uh, Claire Marie, you've already alluded to this in some ways, but I, I wanna invite all of you, particularly around um, the work of, um, the, the, the work of Embry Kendi who says, uh, how to be an anti-racist who says, you approach this work just believing that everybody is a racist and you are working towards being an anti-racist. Could anybody talk about that um, to release the, the pressure, right? The guilt, the shame that often comes with white, particularly white people who, who might wanna have do, do this work, but the, the, the guilt, the shame that they carry, the pressure that they carry that really causes them to not do the work or not do it well. Um, I don't know. So could, would anybody like to jump on that? I, I will. Um, I, I love Ibram's work. Um, I think it's powerful. Dr. Kendi's work for me, the power lies in his own transparency. And I think that that is how parents, um, relatives, adults, whomever can enter into these conversations by recognizing that they are the for first resource in understanding the reach of racist, racism in this country. You don't need to go to a book. You don't need to watch a video or a TED talk. You need to go into your own personal stories and recognize where you have experienced it or have perpetuated it. That's it. So when you're where you when you start to respond to contemporary issues that are happening, if we train our brain to go, how might I have responded to that if it were me? And that's deep because some people see this as so these things are outward experiences that happened to George Floyd, that happened to Breonna Taylor. It wasn't me, it wasn't my neighborhood. But Dr. Kennedy's work encourages us to see us all swimming in this pool of racism. Mm -hmm. So we all are responding to it, even if we're not claiming our response. We are. It's in ourselves, right? And so I think that one of the things that we can do in conversation is to try to pull out our own personal stories. Mm -hmm. How did I respond when I was traveling, Andre knows this story, traveling through Mexico and realized that I was stunned to see wealth in Mexico? Why mm -hmm. am I surprised that there's wealth in Mexico? What does it mean that I don't think Mexicans can be rich? Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness! Am I also just, you know, sort of guilty of all these sort of stereotyping and biases and implicit biases, everyone else? Guilty as charged. But then what do I do with that story? Do I just sort of tuck it in my shame pocket and not tell anybody? Dr. Kenny says, no, you got to go start telling folks, hey, I do it too. I suffer from it too. But I also malign people with it too. And so I think that will both rescue some of us who just who decide to just see us as the receivers of racist thought and racist action and recognize that we are also empowered as racists to do things that are identifiably racist. Take away the binary of victim and villain and you know guilty one and innocent one and all that and says, nope, this is a human issue that we all have to work through together. And I have my own stories. I don't need to go to the library to get a story. I have a story. And so then if you go in your family circles and any kind of circle you're in and you're watching people try to grapple with this tough language and you sort of condense it into, well, let me tell you a story about when this happened to me or when I did this thing. 
then we can recognize what our personal role and attachment to these big ideas are. Yeah. Everybody is swimming in it. We all have the stories. We do. That's right. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, I think part of, particularly our work, anti-racism work we do at Scarab Bennett Center, we talk about the difference between guilt and shame, right? And so guilt is feeling bad for something I did. Shame is this idea that I am bad because of something I did. And so we try to dismantle that thought, right? When we say, listen, we are all drinking the water. It is part of our society. And so that means is we all have implicit bias, right? We all have been socialized to see the other in a way that does not make them human or make us human. And when we're able to accept that, we can release shame and even lean into the guilt and hopefully the guilt motivates you to do the work to become a co-conspirator. And that co-conspirator work is work that you do every day. And oftentimes a co-conspirator is doing that work internally. It's the self-reflection, right? How do you decolonize your own personal thoughts? How do you dismantle the white supremacy that lives within you? right? So that you're able to look at the systems and institutions that are play in place to be an active uh, participate, uh, participant to dismantle it. So let's talk a little bit about, we've, ta we've done a lot of work around the way it affects white people. I want to talk a little bit about racial trauma. And that's, uh, we have two pillars of Scarab Bennett Center, right? Oftentimes anti-racism work centers whiteness and, and, and it's taught through a white lens, right? And we never ever talk about racial trauma, the impact of racism in black and brown communities. So Claire Marie, I want to start with you around this idea of representation matters. Oh yes. Right? Rep so let's talk about books and you talked about images but I also want to talk about for um, all of you the ways in which um, how we tell stories and how we tell history and who we name and we, who we don't name, how it affects children and the ways it participates and supports, right, healing from racial trauma. Let's start with you, Clamory. Yes, um, um, yes, let me affirm that representation matters. Um, being able to see yourself in the me in the in media, see, but see positive, accurate representations of yourself and your family and your cultural group in media, in the books that in the books that are used in the classroom is very important because not seeing yourself, not seeing oneself represented. It does create trauma because it sort it sort of inculcates the idea into the child that my stories don't matter, my family doesn't matter. That's not that's not what we study about. These are not the heroes. This is not what what's important for me to know. And I really believe that um, that yes, representation does matter, and particularly um, it's important to start you know to start, okay, with the children in our home and to, the children in our lives, one of the things I like to say in my work, in my family literacy workshops is that I want everyone who has young children in their lives, moms and dads and teachers and abuelos and abuelas and, you know, aunties and uncles. I'm a Titi. I have, Titi Clem, Titi Clem Marie has four nieces and nephews and they always get books for presents. And particularly, um, I myself am, am Puerto Rican and I always make it a point to give them, if I find a book with a Puerto Rican theme or a Puerto Rican character the kids are going to get it because I want them to be able to see their family their abuelos and abuelas their father and and what they read books um in the children's literature world we often say that books function as windows and mirrors uh, mirrors to be able hopefully to see yourself in the stories that you read to see your family to see your people in the books and the books that you read but also mirrors into other worlds um the um the the um, Rudine Sims Bishop, who is a, who was a very who's known as a mother of multicultural children's literature, a very well known um, educator, talked about books being windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors that you can see yourself in the books, look out into the window to see other worlds, and open that sliding glass door to be able to step step into and know and know somebody else's know somebody else's experience um there's also the idea nowadays of books being prisms that they can refract the light to see a new thing differently tesneem early on you talked about how 
oh, we talk, you know, people often sometimes call us and talk about, oh no, that civil rights history happened in the past. That's the past, but the past is always present. Mm -hmm. And seeing things like those images, that because um the pictures of the civil rights collectors, like, oh, wait, that's happening right now. The George uh, George Floyd happened in my community. That's something that's happening right now. So sort of be able to see the uh, books being able to s refract the light. It's like, oh, the past is always present. Um, police brutality is, you know, was a thing in the 60s and it's still very much, uh, very much an event, something, something that's ongoing. So for me, one of the things that's important is that, yes, it's important, it's important for white families to read, um, to, uh, um, to read diverse books for their children, to read books that have ch uh, children of all backgrounds, all represent representations. But it's also important to really lift up those books for black and brown families who are looking for books to see their families and their children in them and to see children as doing everyday things. A lot of times when um, books are, um, um, so, so, so a lot of times it's like, we only gonna talk about civil rights books and, and they're always heavy and things It's like, but you know, we, it's important to, sh to show books as children being children and to share, have those books at home and to give those books to the children in our lives because it sort of creates, um, starts very early on that, that work of having full representations of who, of who we of who a child is, who their family is at home and at school, and to and to uh, make those books part of everyday part of everyday life. Those representations, because if a child, if a white child is growing up in a in a you know predominantly white environment, they're not you know they're not going to have the representations. They are if we're not intentional about it, the representations they are going to get of black and brown folks are are going to be inaccurate. Are going yeah, to be disrespectful. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I want to talk about that a little bit more, Claire Marie, um, and bring in Andrea and Tasmin because so my background is college. Um, I've worked in college um, spaces, colleges and universities most of my career, and I'm always surprised at students who come and say they were born and raised in white communities in the rural area and they've never seen a black person until they came to college. So imagine, right, a 17, 18 year old and what that experience, that transformation is like their first semester and how traumatic that is in many ways. And also imagine what they heard or did not hear about people who do not look like them. And so I'd like to talk about ways li local public libraries can help, can support the journey of diversifying young people's experiences, lived experiences, particularly those who live in white, predominantly white spaces, white areas, white communities where they do not have access to diversity. How can public libraries support their journey to diversity? Um, I'll start. Um, and if I can um, go back to one of the amazing things um, that you were talking about when we were talking about Dr. Ibram Kendi, you know, just an amazing shout out for those of you who are listening and you go to the library's website, you can search our previous programs where we actually had Dr. Kendi here in this public library talking about this very thing that we're talking about for a couple of hours. So do your homework later and go listen with Dr. Kendi and how he continues to help us, each of us grapple with how we're dealing with this idea of becoming anti-racist. Um, so that's the first thing I wanted to say. Um, and so what can public libraries do? So one of the things that I think is so key when, you know, for those of you who are around the country and you're trying to figure out, so my library doesn't have a civil rights room or my library may not have an entire team dedicated to working with curriculum development for, um, for schools. What, you, what we have found and one of the th greatest resources that we have within our institution is the fact that we have made it, um, we have become a model for other libraries. And so we actually work with other libraries all around the country. Tasneem and I have traveled as far as Springfield, we've gone Louisiana, we've gone everywhere working with public libraries, helping them to do exactly what you just said. How do we diversify our public programming? We even ask questions, how are we diversifying those who are doing story time, right? And so we're talking beyond just a book collection, beyond just a reading list. If we're going to all become these co-conspirators, as we said, we hope we are going to become and anti-racist, then 
then we need to look at the entire structure of an institution that was built on inequity. And so let's start there. And so we we start there. We, we look at an institution, an organization, who's telling your stories, who's creating your public programs? What libraries are you funding? I mean, how are we having these conversations? Why is it? So every public program and library that you go to, um, for instance, who is your children's librarian team? If they all have no melanin in their skin, then we have a problem right there collectively. And so the institution, the library as an institution, number one, has to be prepared and ready to deal with those questions. Um, and Tazim can talk a little bit more about how what, what we do here to make sure that teachers and educators and communities are making sure that we have these conversations. One of the things, Shrezna, you mentioned about trauma. You know, it's so important for us in our work to not only understand what slow grade trauma looks like as we're facilitating, but also it's important for us to realize that no one person bears this burden of eradicating any ism from the world. That's not my responsibility as a person, of, as a black woman. That's not solely my responsibility. Mm -hmm. But we also are very intentional on making sure that when we are working with kids who may have never experienced having a teacher who looks like Andrea or who mm -hmm. looks like Tasneem, we are making sure that the stories that we are telling are not just stories of struggle and mm -hmm. of oppression. Right? Yes, and that is key. And I think it's so key. key as educators, we cannot only just, you know, talk about the oppressive state of black yes. people or any people of color, and that be our diversity and our window to inclusivity. Excellent. Exactly. No. Sure. Yes. Uh, well, we have to be. We um, in the books that we share in the classroom that we share with the children in our lives. They have. I think those books have to show children being children and children being joyful and curious and trying new things and black showing things like black joy and because uh, uh, that is that is important because then I think then that's the that starts inculcating that fear of talking about race. It's like, oh, it's all struggle and it's all hard. And it's no, um, there's there's beauty and there's everyday things that you can see that you can see yourself doing. Um, you know, one of my, you know, like there's lots, you know, just I think it's vital to sh to sh to show that joy and that ev that everyday like that everydayness of children have experiences of you know there's a there's a book series called lola and lola is a little black girl and lola does everything lola goes to the library she plants a garden she gets a cat she reads to her little brother and it's all these things that children children do and it and i think that's that's vital and to make those books not part of the special diversity initiative but to make those um commonplace and regular and everyday books. Currently, for example, we are in what has been uh, declared um, Native American History Month. And a lot of times it's, this is the time when um, teachers or someone, or, you know, like, you know, or librarians will put on special programs about Native Americans and read books about Native Americans. This is not just the one month to do it. You do that year round to show children that this is, this family is like just to hopefully be able to yes use that book as a window but see parts of themselves in it to see it like a mirror yeah yeah the power of storytelling tasmine i want to bring your voice in but i'm just thinking of one of the experiences i had with college students and we were at a workshop or something and we were talking about poverty and the question was where can you know these students respond to poverty um and the first answer that these white students responded to was africa now i was at the poorest state in this country west uh west virginia okay you cannot, you can't go to one corner to the next without seeing poverty in West Virginia. I lived there for almost two years. But when the question about poverty came about to these white students, they automatically thought of Africa. So storytelling, the power of storytelling is messaging, right? And so Tasmin, will you talk a little bit about some of the programmings that you all offer at Nashville Public Library as it relates to this here? Yeah, that's a great example of being able to say says who, right? So if we mm -hmm. talk about poverty and you say, oh, it must be Africa, says who? Mm -hmm. Really? Um, so I, I, some of the programs we offer have a lot to do with paying attention to what contemporary interests our guests have. And those are either in the library guests or guests that we're actually going to 
their schools or businesses or corporate boardrooms, whatever. We try to um, look at the amazing sources of media that tell stories that people don't expect to find. So Vanguard of the Revolution talking about the Black Panthers. We have programs that help to both demystify revolutionaries and also to expand our knowledge of them. So suddenly we are aware that there are the Black Panthers and the Yellow Panthers and the Brown Panthers and the Red Panthers and people are like, we didn't know that. Well, now you know. And so that's also pointing to a resource that the library has, which is also helping people to see beyond their original understanding of something, how to not be afraid of people who might have been called combative or counter, counter government. Another other kinds of programs that we get very excited about is that when people invite us in to help them look at their interpersonal relationships around race, identity, and social justice. Mm -hmm. Andrea and I can sit for hours thinking about different ways to help folks not just be so centered on history, but to recognize the history they're making as a family, a work family or an actual family. So if I can pay attention to what's in the news, how am I paying attention to the person whose cubicle is beside me? Mm -hmm. If I'm only exposed to people who look like me, but then I go into different spaces, um, both in my job or at my university or wherever, um, how do, what are my first impressions of that person? What do I imagine that their first impression of me is? And so those kinds of engagements, again, very tailored, very customized to the people who are asking to have them are really pushing towards some introspection. We do become aware that we all have sort of libraries of lived experience, mm -hmm. that we have tucked in our own personal archives in our brains, how we're sort of getting to information. So when we get into a room, we ask that question, when did you notice certain things? When did you notice social injustice? People always start talking about, well, when I was six or I was five or my grandparents said this to me. And so really pressing upon people that, you know, are, we mentioned that parents are a child's first teachers. We're also their first librarian. We're the first people who say this information is valid. This is legitimate. This is how you should see yourself. This is how you should see other people. And so when we get invitations and we're getting we're getting more invitations. When we get invitations to come in and facilitate those conversations, I feel like that's when we're actually getting closer to the word transformation. Mm. We don't expect a huge shift, but we start to expect shifts in how people see themselves. And I think that's where all change begins. Do I get to look in the mirror and recognize both the things I'm not proud of and some of the things that I'm trying to become more proud of? I would say too, that when people are looking at imagining different neighborhoods and different people. Going to libraries is beautiful, but I think also acknowledging that folks who we might see as them have their own ways of recording their histories and their own ways of maintaining information about their own stories. There are agencies in every city that are social justice or social service agencies that have their own libraries. And by libraries, I don't mean just books. I mean ways of passing on information, be it oral, be it optical, however it is. So you don't necessarily have to champion this public space of a library as being the only place you can go to learn more about people. Go there To imagine that there are actual Latinos who have Latino libraries who have ways of archiving their history, right, Marie, that are not necessarily connected to the library. That's right. I think people also need to go into libraries and start to question the staff. They need to say, and once you get into a consciousness that says, I'm looking for books about me, you need to also look for people working there who look like you. Yes. That's where some of the shift is going to take place. If it's just a library of white people, what are we expecting? That's right. That's good. If it's just a library of black people, what are we expecting? If yeah. it's just a whole bunch of sameness, you're not going to get expanded thought or expanded views. And I think the patrons need to start asking those questions. Ask the librarians, well, can you please point me to the person who might be an indigenous person who's put up this display for Native American History Month? That's good. Mm -hmm. Where is that person? And then ask why that person's not there or why mm -hmm. those people aren't there. The library is there to serve you. Yes. What are they serving? That's so good. push them forward. That's good. This is great. Wow. Um, I, I really have more questions. We can do this 
all day, but I want to move to the Q&A because there are a lot of questions that's come through from the audience. So I want to bring the audience thoughts in this space. Um, Claire Marie, I'm going to start with you, but anyone can also add to this. Uh, a question from the audience. I'd love to get some anti-racism reading lists from, your, from you for elementary age kids. Definitely want to uh, kind of pick your brains um, all they can. So here's a question from the audience around uh, anti-racism reading list for elementary aid kid, children. Yes, um, I actually, for this program, put together a list to start um, talking about, you know, books for this, to start these conversations with children and to, uh, to sort of have that anti-racist reading list. But keep in mind that this isn't just, isn't just a one-time thing. You're not gonna read a list of books and um, hey, and have these books at home, perhaps then later on gathering dust. Hey, all of a sudden I'm anti-racist. Uh, we all know that earlier this year in the summer, um, books written by black authors following the murder of George Floyd really um, shot up in the New York Times bestseller list because, you know, people were buying these books to learn and everything. But then we have seen um, just following not, you know, not to get too partisan, but to call call it out that mm -hmm. um, following the general election, for example, 50, you know, 55 percent of white women voted for Trump. These, who's buying these books and then apparently letting them gather dust on their shelves. That's right. Um, so part of it's, you know, to have, you know, to have these books and, but to use them and to come back to them again and again. I did um, put, um, have shared some reading lists on um, books for discussing diversity and difference with children. Um, another reading list I put together picture books for black lives um, and also a picture books for black history month. But keep in mind, these are books for you to use year round, not just during one particular month or after one particular event. These are books Right. And also, it's important when we have these books at home to come back to them, these libraries, to come back to them time and time again. This isn't just a one-time conversation. When you're sharing a book with a child, because particularly I work with um, early children's literacy, and you know, when a child is learning to read, there's a lot of different things going on. When you're talking with an adult who, you know, can read and, you know, can discuss things on a higher level, there's other things going on. But I know particularly for me, for children who are parents who are sharing books with their children at home, it's important, you know, there's no law that says that you have to finish a book, a picture book, particularly in one sitting. You can read three pages and come back to it and sort of, you know, share books about kids being kids we have mentioned, but also revisit books to go back into the text and also to be afraid after you're reading these books. Well, mom, why did that happen? Well, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Mm. I'm not quite sure. Let's go find out. That's let's fair. read, so, let's learn some more, both you and I. You know, you know, I as I'm an adult, but adults, you know, adults don't know everything. So it's, you know, so so so, so and the beauty to learn with your children, I think, is also important to yes. be committed to learn with your children is also important. Again, audience members, all of these resources that Claire Marie is talking about, the links are in the comments. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to Andrea and Tasmin. Oftentimes we think about books, but there are so many other tools and resources yes. that are available. So, and I know the two of you just started your podcast which are great so could we talk about other avenues that that parents and adults can include beside books um, to push the agenda of diversity what other resources that are available films and so you know yeah let's talk about conversation we yeah. can encourage our children by modeling to start interviewing our, our families, interviewing our neighbors. We can bring back the oral tradition, which of course is linked to oral literacy. We, um, that we are walking books. So go find somebody in the neighborhood, if not in your house, to sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil or your phone on record in the memo app, whatever you're using, and to get them used to asking questions. That's good could be challenging for some people because um, in some, some of our families, we're not encouraged to ask questions of adults, mm -hmm. but we're, we're trying to encourage curiosity. Okay. We're also trying to teach a skill and that is, that's, those are research skills, right? But I think that trying to get them to become curious. So what, how did you respond when this happened to you? And so what did you do next? How did that feel? It's empowering for a young person to get permission to begin to delve into sort of the memories of some adults 
tr start training young folks to ask each other questions. Like this whole art and science of conversation is in itself an entire universe that they can get lost in. Yeah. Sometimes we put so much emphasis on the written word, we forget about the power of orality. And I think we need to bring it back and make it relevant so that it both legitimizes it as just sort of a social exchange, but it's a great way to gain knowledge and, and information. It's a great way to expose different truths. Speaking of our podcast, truth be told. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about different truths talking about different ways of seeing things. And so you get to that be by using the art of conversation. Andrea, what would you add? The only thing I would add to that is, um, is how do we take something that seems so pie in the sky as the art of conversation? And for the educator who's listening, they're like, but I'm gonna make that work in my classroom, right? And so then you take the need for the art of conversation, you reach out to your public library staff, Tazim and Andrea, and say, I wanna create a whole lesson on how to teach my children how to become oral historians, which we've done. And so we literally go to the go step by step with teachers. We take our equipment in the classrooms. We even have an app that we can actually show them how to use model open-ended questions. So not only are we getting at this idea of helping students to become inquisitive and curious, we're teaching them how to ask open-ended questions. We're teaching them how to document history, how to interpret history, reinterpret history, and challenge a narrative that they may thought they knew about their family or that particular group of people. So that's how we take this idea of an art of a conversation and what does it really look like in practical terms for the classroom, for the parent, um, for all of us. That's why you have such, you know, you have oral history um, organizations or companies like StoryCorps that is like, you know, this amazing thing because you take the art of conversation, you make it practical for people, you tell people why they need to do, do, continue to do it and how easy it is to do that. Yeah, and so when we talk about these resources, the resources are unlimited. Um, yeah. There just has to be someone to be committed. I, I think that we are forgetting that part of commitment, whether it is in a book list, whether it is how do I talk to my children, how do I change the staff at my rural library, there has to be a level of commitment on whoever is making that change and making that push, and you have to expect what that backlash is going to look like. And so if you are saying, I am now going to be anti-racist and a co-conspirator and I'm all these things, you have to be A, prepared what that backlash is gonna be, be prepared that you're not gonna have support or minimal support, and then are you gonna continue with the work? And so it, you have to take all of that, and I know that's a long answer and I'm sorry, you but know. we have to look at it in its totality of how we're all gonna to get to that place at the end. Speaking of art, the art of conversation, for those who are watching, particularly our white audience, uh, the urge oftentimes around diversity and anti-racism is to go and have conversations with your black and brown friends. Don't do that. We understand white supremacy lives in white communities and white spaces. You wanna dismantle white supremacy, stay in the white community and the white spaces and have those difficult conversations with your white friends in white community. Because what often happens is you go to your black friends and you don't even realize that you're triggering them. You go to your black friends and you are asking them to hold right that space to take care of you in that space and to be the all know all of that space. And they're the ones who are inflicted. We're the victims of white supremacy. And so it is unfair. I think Shrezna froze for a little bit. I know she was going to say it's unfair. Yeah, she was probably she gonna was going to say it. Yes, uh, she did froze. Um, we apologize for that. Technology is. Yeah, it's the greatest thing. I would it's like while she's freezing and unfreezing, I will just add to our audience that, you know, the notion of what she's talking about of who has to carry that burden, it's nothing new. And so yes. this idea of us wanting to have these very diverse conversations with our friends of color or our friends or my black friend, um, the idea that we 
um, can have these conversations in our own spaces is nothing new. And I have to use the example of how the student led movement in the 1960s, mm -hmm. you know, was formed. And so you have, you have students who were on these historically black college and campus and universities realizing that their effort was one thing. And then they were saying to these students on these predominantly white college campuses, like maybe you need to start on your campus and do the work there. So what Shrezna was talking about is not a new notion. Um, it's, wow. it's the same thing that we've seen. But it's also the idea of um, that a lot of times and because um, because um, white people don't have these conversations all that often, there isn't that sort of what, what you know, the stamina or sort of like, hey, you know, the, you know, to have these conversations. And whereas um, black folks and brown folks and indigenous folks, what have you have these conversations. This is a part of, every, you know, have these conversations regular regularly and it is traumatizing and triggering to sort of uh, be asked or forced to act as a confessor or a comforter for a white person who is uncomfortable having this conversation when you're a black or brown friend, maybe very well also really uncomfortable to be having this conversation right. with you. But, but you know, you're seeing, you know, they're, you know, you're seeing them as the expert in race, right. whereas race is a construct that was created by white supremacy and it's sort and, it, and, and it's sort of the idea of like oh no they're just playing the race card i'm like the race card was invented and played by euro americans first yeah i think dakota probably has some more questions for us from yes. the audience or because the three of us we can keep talking but i noticed dakota you had some more questions i do yeah i'm just gonna hop in here and field the questions from our audience while she and gets back on um and we were just speaking about you know the power of talking about these kind of ha having these conversations in, in white spaces. Um, one of the questions, can the panelists talk about whitewashing in multiple generations of now adults who are being confronted with the real life issues of racism that they can no longer justify, blame marginalized groups for, or turn a blind eye towards? What now, now that their eyes have been opened? Yeah, um, I think I, I would love to, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw an audible at Taz's name on this question, but I would love for her to give the example and talk about, um, for instance, part of our programming design. What she has designed is this idea of once you notice, you know, the idea of noticing when you can no longer deny that you notice. What do you do now, Taz's name? If you could talk to him a little bit about like that program of, like, look based on James Baldwin, and we're talking about we can't unlook and unsee once we notice. Big question, right? Um, I think it is important to know these questions plague everybody. Just because someone calls themselves living the lifestyle of an anti-racist doesn't mean that they've arrived at any special place of comfort. Uh, just listening to you ask the question, Dakota, I thought, exhale. So um, once you do start to notice, which is the language we use um, in some of, of the work that we do. Once you have gotten to the place of noticing, what do you do with it? I think that you have to also contemplate two other words. And one is responsibility and another one is sacrifice. It is our belief that you won't come to any transformation, the first being personal without either of those two things. So the noticing is not enough. It is nice that now you see things. And I think that that awareness can take you to the next step, but it is by in no, means supposed to be the the landing place it's just it's just a launch pad so now i see it what do i do you have to contemplate the duty you have to the awareness and then you have to figure out what you need to give up to get to the place of activism that the list of that there's a spectrum that is so broad some people will just stay in awareness and they'll be the person in conversations who will say well i just saw on c-span and for them just being able to you know spew some stat or piece of data it makes them feel very good that's awesome other people are going to go beyond feeling good because once you get beyond awareness you have to recognize your role in the ignorance this is where it gets sticky how did the ignorance serve you all these years in denial did what for you so the responsibility and sacrifice part, what do I owe my community in terms of believing that the awareness is supposed to be a benefit for everybody? What do I need to give up? 
so that the privilege I've had of my years of denial or lack of attention to detail, what do I, how do I put that aside? How do I change something that's been a norm so that the, I can now enliven this awareness into action? That's what, I, that's what we offer, this idea of personal responsibility and personal sacrifice. If we study the great revolutionaries, right? If we look at history, you will find those words coming up again and again and again. If you look at contemporary revolutionaries, you will find those words coming up again and again and again. I gave this up because I saw this was my duty to do this thing. Right. That's what we offer. Yeah, and I, I think people, um, I, I think the realization of understanding what that duty and responsibility and commitment looks like, um, we have to recognize and acknowledge that that is what it looks like. Not all communities, not all families, not all educators, not all people who say they're on the right side of justice is going to ever move beyond seeing, noticing, right? And so that continuum of noticing to action continues, right? And, and so we, we don't get to turn off this idea, even though there's the idea of um, numbness we can become numb to what we see, you know, we can become cynical of, oh, wait a minute, another shooting, you know, like, or we can become all of those things. We have to recognize all of those feelings, all those emotional emotions, and all of those steps that we must continue to take. So the journey, in the words of Dr. Ibram Kendi, the, the journey to anti-racism is, is ongoing, but it is a lifestyle, as Sherezna said to us earlier, it is a lifestyle. It is not something that we turn on and create a hashtag. And because yes, now it's the thing to do, and that is what makes us do that, we have to realize that there will always be a sacrifice. And sometimes we never see what that end sacrifice is going to look like as an activist. Tazneem, I saw your finger. <laughs> Yeah, church finger. Um, you know, we, we liken a lot when we're in these conversations. It, it, it seems to be a fine analogy to compare some of the life call and lifestyle of anti-racism to how we look at our bodies. Once we decide that we want to feel a certain way in our body, we want to, we want to change our eating habits, we want to become vegan, we want to take, you know, stop eating meat, whatever we want to do, that we become scholars of it. You get online and you start researching, how do I do it? You start finding people to follow. You, you get it, you start finding blogs, you listen to the podcast. Everything is sort of tunnel visioned in on this new way of seeing yourself. And then you think, well, what do I, what habits do I need to change? Okay. What time do I need to wake up now? I'm going to meditate or I'm going to go for a run. I'm going to go for a walk. Then you have books in your house that reflect that new view. You, your friends are reflecting that new view. How is that different than the life call of anti-racism? That's right. And the whole goal is to transform your body, right? So this is the, the goal for here is to transform your perspective and transform your spirit. It requires the same level of energy and commitment. No one could say that a month of not eating French fries is going to help you lose 10 pounds and that 10 pounds will never come back. You have to commit to it for the duration as in until death and maybe even beyond that. It's the same examples, the same level of stamina, the same level of discipline, the same level of changing your social circle and all the thoughts that are going into your mind. If you are a meat eater and I have committed to veganism, we are probably going to change the, the, the nature of our relationship. So now all of these things have to change if this is what I'm saying my life call is. It can be that big. For some people, it will be small. They'll say, well, I'm going to read the speeches that Dr. King wrote in the 1950s, and that will be their entree and maybe their, their staying place into social justice and social activism and social awareness. But for those folks who are trying to walk a different path, think about the other paths you've walked in changing who you are and how you see yourself. Copy that. How you had to change everything. The clothes you wore, the, the language you spoke, the foods you ate. Same thing if you want to be an anti-racist. It's holistic. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question that I think still relates to that. Any thoughts on how to combat backlash to bringing programs and books to more rural areas? And I think the commenter uh, clarified, that speaking about white rural areas, particularly in the South. 
I'll quickly just address that. Um, and I think that role and that responsibility has to come either, um, Tazane mentioned earlier, from the community. If this is what you are expecting your public library in a rural all white area to do, then, then you are the taxpayer in that city. And these this is what you must require. But you cannot go into the expectation of creating more inclusive programs for any community without realizing that mm -hmm. there will be backlash, okay. right? I think if we honor that first, there will be backlash you have to figure that out. And you also have to be thinking about that at the same time. Sometimes there's power in, in politics and how politics play in this. And sometimes you're fighting a battle that's on your own. And that's when that personal responsibility comes in. If you cannot change the landscape in an entire county or an entire institution who still has this idea of, you know, colonialism that is, is still rich within our programming and how we teach our kids and engage with our communities, then that becomes now a personal responsibility. So yeah. if I'm living in a county that's going to be so focused on this and never hear or never notice, then that personal responsibility happens to now become in my home. One of the things Tazanim and I did was work with a community that was 98% white which realized that they never had to change. And then the question was, so then whose responsibility is that? And that just may be a personal responsibility. If you're fighting an institution that you can't change at that time, then the responsibility is still yours. You can't say that my county or, you know, we, my public library, my county, my schools, they don't want to um, practice this or they don't want to have kindy or they don't want to have authors of color. Then that's your, your responsibility in your home. Yeah, and I think um, if I may jump in, Tasneen, you also, I think, also alluded to that what you spoke about sacrifice, that it does call, like, you, you know, if you want to, if the culture and the institution of, of the United States and, you know, and if, you know, libraries and as an institution are part of the United States and therefore beholden to white supremacy, it's going to happen that yes, you um, some people are going to push back, but I think also there are people in your community who will be who will feel seen, who will feel like oh, I'm not, I'm not alone. There are yes, the, the, you know we tend to think of rural communities as predominantly white, but demographics continue to change, and uh, there are people in your community who are you know who will feel seen, who are not currently being represented. And you're doing that, this work for them. And I think also for others in your community who are open to it. And it's like, oh, wait, I'm not the only one who feels this way. I'm not the only one who feels we should be, and we should work toward anti-racism. I think that's that's important. Yes, you know, sometimes, you know, speaking as a librarian, someone's gonna get mad about a book display about, about you know black lives matter but there'll be some people who will like think who, who will gravitate to, to towards that and i think it, you can't yeah you, you probably you know it's going to be very difficult to change an entire county but i think that um professor emily towns a womanist theologian talks about the idea my background is in theology my former life i was a religious studies scholar sharizna knows this um that um Everyday moral actions matter, and if anti-racism is anti-racism is anti-racism is a matter of morality, of what's right and what's wrong. So I think every that everyday action does matter. But I think sometimes we want to change everything, and it's like, well, that's sort of that sort of the colonizing way. Like I'm going to be the hero. I'm going to be the white savior. Like no. You, it's part of the work of the of the labor that goes into it. Let me, let me add also, particularly for those who are watching, um, anti-racism work is disruptive. And I think that we need to get real with this work. And I appreciate, Tasmin, what you said about the holistic approach to this. Uh, there's this fantasy that you can do anti-racism work and be nice right? And to have nice conversations, right? And to be, stay comfortable. You cannot grow and you cannot do this work and be comfortable, right? So part of anti-racism work is living in discomfort, right? Part of anti-racism work is confrontation, right? Part of anti-racism work is interrupting the social norm of racism. It is disruptive. It is messy. It is confrontational. And until you're committed to the holistic approach and committed to disrupting norms, committed to making people upset, committing to oftentimes having to stand 
by yourself to speak this truth without applause, without an audience, without support, right? Anti-racism work is disruptive wherever you go, right? People are gonna try to shut you down, silence you, right? You're gonna be the one who is causing trouble, but that is the work, is to get into good trouble, like John Lewis would say, to interrupt the social norm of racism. And so uh, I don't know if there's a right or wrong way of uh, handling, right, or ma managing backlash. You're going to get it. I think just accepting the fact that backlash is going to ha happen. So part of your plan should be accepting the fact that backlash will happen. And when it happens, how do you support you and protect you? Because it's going to happen. Anti-racism work is disruptive, period. What that, what's that last question, Dakota? Yeah, thank you. We have a, a one more that I think is a good one to end on. Um, it's actually coming from one of our staff members here at Scarrett Bennett. So they mentioned that when they go to libraries, they feel a little intimidated and overwhelmed because there's so much. Uh, is there any resource, a book, archive, collection that the panelists wish uh, patrons would utilize more? Uh, what's the gem that makes you think, this is what I wish every parent, teacher, librarian, visitor were accessing? Yeah, I, I have to brag on Taz's name on this part because when I, I've seen this, I've seen her do this with a parent, a parent of three young children who was just in this exact example that your staff gave, wanting to talk to her children about racism, but was so intimidated on coming into the civil rights room. Um, and literally, I know Tasneem worked with that mother, that one mother invested time an entire year to get her comfortable and actually telling. So number one, the step was helping her acknowledge the discomfort. <laughs> number two was helping her realize if you're never going to come in, you're never going to confront it, you're never going to deal with racism, the very nature of you being wanting to stay a bay at your discomfort, um, then you're not ready for that conversation, being bold enough to say that. And so that parent has to understand if they're not ready and they're and it's uncomfortable, well, that's understandable. Just the institution of what libraries were set up on their founding, this idea of collectors and higher ed and knowledge can be intimidating for a lot of people. It's intimidating for all of us. And so that person who has that question should reach out to, first of all, let me just say they can reach out to the three of us, any of us, and we will be happy to help them navigate maybe coming downtown to the civil rights room in this huge monstrous building is too much then let's point them in the direction of maybe their local branch, you know, post pandemic, um, or some local resources that we can help you with to be able to navigate that. But that parent also has to be aware of their own personal responsibility and where they're going to play in that because no librarian or library staff is going to take on the responsibility of making someone feel comfortable if that person is not willing to work with us. There has to be some level of okay, I'm going to get it. We're going to help you get it. We're going to baby step it, Bob, all the way there. But there has to be some level of responsibility as well. Thank you all and so much. And we offer, mm -hmm. oh, really briefly, this is another analogy that I think works. You know, when you give a child a shot, you say, it's going to hurt, baby, but it's good for you. And I think sometimes we have to use that same kind of language. It's going to hurt a little bit, but it's good for you. It's called medicine. And it's not cherry flavor. We're gonna give it to you, swallow it down. And so that, that kind of um, looking for other examples in the lives of folks to say that you do this already, you do hard stuff, you do uncomfortable things, you do it all the time. Just take that same resolve and use it in this, in this place as well. Okay, awesome. I mean, what an amazing hour, um, hour and a half this has been, I mean, our, our comment section is lit up. Uh, people are just commending, commenting on how excellent your professionalism and your resources and the work that you all do here in Nashville. We're so blessed to have you all um, at our Nashville Public Library. As we close out the space, I want to give you all the opportunity to offer closing remarks about what it means to be uh, one who's responsible to raise co-conspirators in our midst 
and uh, what, how can uh, library services in Nashville, but all over the world can support adults and the young people in doing this work. It is imperative that we are intentional about raising co-conspirators, that we are shifting the narrative with children, that we are preparing children for a society that is full of racism everywhere we go, yet diversity is who we are. Mm -hmm. And so what do we do with difference, right? How do we prepare children to embrace and celebrate and live, um, live with diversity in a, a moral way? And how can library services and the resources and the programs that libraries offer support that work. So I'm going to start with you, Claire Marie, um, particularly around literacy. Um, would you would you share your closing remarks with our audience about what it means to raise co-conspirators? I think what it means to raise co-conspirators is um, we've talked about these things about that there are times that I know having young children in your lives and forming them is difficult and having an uncomfortable at times and having these conversations with children can be particularly uncomfortable and sometimes even fraught because kids will be very honest and they will ask and they will ask, they will cut to the quick of the matter and i think it's it's important but i think it's part of making it uh part of your everyday life um like libraries, one of the things that we do um, during untypical times, you know, we have things like story times where children, you know, children can meet children from all over and sort of, and you know, do that. But I think also we can help you find, we can help you find ways to amplify your home library because it's important for children as a, as a literacy advocate, an early literacy advocate, it's important for children to see you read. And it's important for us um, to uh, be intentional about the books that they see us reading and also the books that we share with them. And sometimes you may think about, but I don't know where to start as far as, you know, like, Build, you know, sharing books with books with my child. Um, so uh, I know in the in the comments on the Facebook, the library concierge service was put up. If you're looking for books about a, around a particular subject, librarians can help you put together a book pack. When now we're doing curbside pickups, so we can put together a stack or a list. Um, I think it has. I think it has to be part of parents willing to be uncomfortable and also to be willing to say, I don't know. Let's, you know, let's find out. Um, Andrea, you, you spoke about how Tasneem um, worked with that parent for a year, worked with a parent for a year um, to be able to have these conversations and sort of the realization that you're not going to raise a, an anti-racist child in one sitting or in one year, that it's going to be a lifelong thing. And our children are exposed to a lot of different viewpoints and, you know, being anti-racist is counter is countercultural. So I think it's important to to sort of realizing that it's going to be sort of you know coming back to this again and again and again and being intentional about the kinds of activities we have with our children, the kinds of things that we we, we do with them. And but I think it's it, it's going to be like raising a child is a lifelong thing. So raising a co-conspirator, an anti-racist co-conspirator is going is going to be the li a lifelong thing. Because I think also not many of us were raised with that mindset. So we in a sense have to heal our you know do the work of healing and raising ourselves. Um, you know, and, and sort of addressing what we experience as children. So, but like Charisma said, and I think our Andrea said, you can reach out to any, you know, any one of us as far as, di as far as different resources with, um, that the library offers. I particularly work with um, helping parents share, you know, you know, be more intentional about literacy in their daily law and their daily lives. Um, so you can definitely reach out to me and we can, we can talk about that, but also, you know, being intentional about the kinds of books that we read aloud to our children. 
Dear Marie, thank you so much for your passion, your wisdom, um, being a great co-conspirator doing this work. We're so grateful to have you this afternoon and Nashville is blessed to have you at the Nashville Public Library. Thank you. Taz, Taz Marie, oh, uh, Taz, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm the mix your name with Claire Marie's name. Tasmeen, will you offer closing remarks to our audience? Uh, what, what does it mean to raise co-conspirators in this day and age and how to does um, library services support that work? Yeah, thank you for that question. One of my friends uh, uses the phrase that she's raising revolutionaries. And I like that language. I like the language because it suggests a certain power in being a questioner and being curious and being analytical. Um, and being suspicious sometimes. And that I think when we do that, we break a norm, which is to say you're young, so be quiet and let the adults tell you how to think. And so when we think about raising revolutionaries, we can go into any situation in which there is a sort of um, typical and normal way to think and normal way to follow adults and normal way to be sort of um, subservient to these ideas that adults have and that, you know, I'm a young person, I'm not supposed to think a certain way. But when we reach this age of consciousness, when we begin to question that we can invite young folks and adults too who are, who are entering into a new phase of social consciousness to ask bigger questions and to ask the questions of other human beings, not just sort of, in some ways it's easy to pick up a book and just look at a, a, a line of text and say, okay, this is gonna give me my information we are in community with people. And I think that when we're raising revolutionaries, we're also raising people to be curious enough, to be bold enough, to begin to get into community with people with whom we can have honest conversations, honest disagreements, and open our minds into new ways of thinking. So raising co-conspirators and raising revolutionaries, tandem goal for me. Tasmeen, thank you so much. Love your passion and your willpower and, and even the, 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 the vision to raise revolutionaries as co-conspirators in this day and age. We so need this. Thank you so much, Taz, Tasmeen. Nashville is so blessed to have you there at the Nashville Public Library. And we're grateful at Scarrett Bennett Center to, to share this space and time with you today. And last but surely not least, um, Andrea, would you share your thoughts on what it means to raise co-conspirators and how can library services support that work? Thank you, and I'll promise I'll make this brief, something I'm never, I never am. I will say from, as an institution, if libraries around the country could change their shift in their thought process, as in creating public programs, move away from thinking of the traditional roles at which we serve, that people are consumers of, you know, of, of this information. If we move our thought process away from that as this collective community and see our role, our primary role is nothing more but to prepare young people for the world that they're about to inherit and that they are living in. That's it. That's how libraries can do it. Andrea Blackman, thank you so much. Um, for sharing this space and time. And Nashville is so blessed to have you there leading the civil rights and the women's rights room and all the other programming and leadership that you provide at the Nashville Public Library. So grateful to have you. For our audience, uh, we did not have time to answer all your questions. We, we forward your questions to our panelists, but let me also encourage you, um, beloved, if you do have a question, um, if you have a question, you're, you are able, you can use the Nashville Public Library's online concierge form to request specific resources, questions, books, and they'll be happy to support you in terms of curating a custom stack of books for you. And that's also a way that you can contact them to ask questions in terms of how to prepare you and your family and your classroom and, 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 and community to be co-conspirators in our midst. Again, we want to thank all of our panelists today. And we want to say thank you to our audience for uh, joining us in the conversation. Many resources in our comments section in this live stream. So we want to encourage you to read the, the resource and how to contact our panelists. Um, they're right here in Nashville. Um, for those who are not in Nashville, we want to encourage you to use this conversation to, to support you in terms of how to ask those questions in your um, libraries and your cities um, and area. Thank you again for having us. 
God bless you and goodbye.